yes, what's up, Aru? You know, the all-devouring narwhal isn't actually from Tevat. It's one of the invaders that want to eat Tevat. Its description says that whatever is in the stars is trying to invade this world and that a higher power is trying to protect it. This could be a telltale sign that the abyss is out there consuming other worlds and that Tevat is only still alive because of the heavenly principles. So why are we trying to fight the heavenly principles? And why does Nisnaya want to destroy the heavenly principles? I don't know. But that is the exact premise for this video. Today we'll be going over the new characters of the Abyss, the Visionary, Sertology, and Vedderfolnir, how they and the Abyss are connected to Tevat and its ties to fate, the possibility that the Fatui are recreating a deceased descender, the creation of the fire giant Surtur using different Norse mythological inspirations found in Genshin, and how the entire world may just be waiting for its impending doom. This video is entirely speculatory using lore from the game and some inspirations that may be taken from real life. Will not be canon events and are only theory so don't spread what I say as actual lore. Now let's get right into the video. Sertology in Norse mythology is the fire that Surtur, the fire giant, uses to set the world ablaze and destroy it with. Now putting aside the actual flames that are mentioned in Norse mythology, I think that the flames of the abyss are a better representation, similar to the blue flame that Dainsleaf and our sibling uses in the Travail teaser and in patch 1.4. We can also see a form of flames from Child's Foul legacy as well as the abyss mob within the all-devouring narwhal creating rifts with a more purple flame, even though it's classified as electro. So Sertology or the Foul's power is the abyssal flames as it is in his name, Surtur's Flames. And his legacy is the legacy of the flames, the Foul Flames legacy. He also knows Rhyndaughter, who is really good at Chemia, Conria's form of alchemy, both of which could have come from Conria because of their knowledge of the Abyss. Rhyndaughter recently obtained the Heart of Nabarius, which she could be using to create an ideal primordial being in her primordial human project. This was an old theory that Albedo was just a step to create a human, and that Rubido is going to be something else, using the heart of Nabarius. Now keep Sertology and Rhyndaughter in mind for later. Vedderfolnir is said to be a hawk sitting between the eyes of an eagle perched on top of Yggdrasil. Vedderfolnir is presumably connected to wisdom and so is also presumed to be a carrier of knowledge to the eagle, similar to Odin's ravens Hagen and Umagen. I don't think that Vedderfolnir is Nicole, since knowledge in and of itself isn't exactly tied to world direction only. Nicole is more akin to a visionary, since it's more about the future and predicting that future. Future. Vedderfolnir, however, could be a different person entirely that possesses vast amounts of knowledge of multiple worlds. And since an eagle or hawk can technically fly away from any tree, then Vedderfolnir and this eagle can go to other worlds and take in knowledge without being affected by said worlds' laws. This could explain why the Ermine Soul is somewhat hacked by a third-party entity that could be related to the Abyss, as mentioned by the Traveler. So it's possible that Vedderfolnir also also has the ability to use the Abyss since forbidden knowledge is heavily tied to the Abyss. And knowledge of the fake sky, forbidden knowledge as well as Celestia and the Abyss's secrets are all knowledge obtained by this hawk sitting on an eagle's eyes perched on top of Yggdrasil. The Ermine Soul is where all ley lines of Tevat are tied to, hence its ability to store the history of the world. But we've learned before that history, or people's memory of history, could be changed. Because of this, we don't exactly know if history is the real history that everyone in Tevat knows. Even the Archons themselves aren't immune to changes in the Ermine Soul's records. So it's possible that all the lore we know about Tevat isn't accurate and could also change depending on how the Ermine Soul is used. Events like the Cataclysm, the Archon War, and possibly what exactly happened with the Dragon Sovereigns and the Primordial One might not be as accurate as we think. This whole narrative that Tevat is a lie and nothing or no one can be trusted unless they aren't affected by the Ermine Soul changes means that the Dragon Sovereigns may know the real history that happened. The Primo Vishap, Apep, 
Nouvellet, Zhong Li, Ejzaha, talking baptismal bishops, if possible, might know the real history of Tevet. But aside from dragons, we also have special people that possibly know more than the dragons. Dainsleaf, Skirk, Alice, Vederfolnir, Sertology, and other members of the Hexen Circle may also know what Nouvellet calls the unadulterated truth of the past, and are more familiar with what Skirk and Dane call powers from beyond this world. The Silver Twig speaks of a sage who gained knowledge of runescribing and ancient words after hanging upside down from a tree. This newfound knowledge allowed a kingdom on the roots of this tree to unveil the secrets of the cosmos. Now aside from theorizing that Kanria is situated on the Ermin Sol, King Ermin of Kanria is also called One-Eyed King Ermin, which again points us to Norse mythology. Odin, who acquired great knowledge by sacrificing his eye, hanging himself on the Yggdrasil tree to understand the secrets of ancient runes. Something I want to focus on is Odin looking downward after hanging himself. If King Ermin was hanging upside down, as said in the silver twig, and looking downward, he would see the sky of which he would then possibly find the secrets of the Abyss. This was an old theory about King Ermin and how he discovered the secrets of the Abyss, which if true, is the reason these new characters are so proficient at handling and even wielding the Abyss to their wills. This is a side tangent about fate and the Abyss, as well as people who dwell in the Abyss. The fate of anyone who isn't from Tevet cannot be foretold, at least by people from Tevet. One instance is Mona and the Traveler. So what about people from the Abyss? Skirk, Vedorfolnir, Sertology, every other Hexen Circle member, and anyone from the Abyss for that matter. Conrians, Dainsleaf, our sibling, Caribear, the Loom of Fate, who we theorized as someone who can weave and change fate as they please. If fate is revealed through the Sea of Stars, and the Abyss is tied to it, then for anyone in the Abyss, has a connection to the Abyss, or can control it, would they have the power to have any fate? Or is their fate obscured with others? Or they just have no fate at all? If so, then can the Heavenly Principles predict what they do next, or was that the reason Conria and the Cataclysm occurred? Dabbling with the Sea of Stars is to taunt the Heavenly Principles and fate itself. And fate is tied to everything and everyone in the game. Dainsleep's title, Bow Keeper, would mean that he keeps the secrets of Ermin Sol before it was changed. We know from the Silver Twig as well as Nahida and Ruka Devata that branches or bows can contain new life or information. We also know from the parable of the tree from before the sun and moon that a spirit tree can be cut up and replanted to create a new spirit tree, and that spirit tree's memories would still be intact after cutting and replanting it. But what if we cut a branch from the Ermin Soul before it changes memories of history? Then would that branch have the unadulterated truth that Tevat has? Another point I want to talk about is Dainsleaf's Kanrian title, Twilight Sword. The Twilight Sword is the sword that Surtur used to destroy Asgard, killing all the gods as well as setting the galaxy ablaze. Dainsleaf itself is also a sword in Norse mythology that cannot be healed once scratched by and kills people once it's un Unsheathed, similar to the ailments of being affected by the abyss, which could be heavily tied to Sertology, the flames of Surtur. Not saying that they're the same person, but their use of the abyss could have similar origins. Origins of which where the abyss actually comes from. So this power from beyond likely originates from something or someone that more or less is the manifestation of the abyss, which could possibly be Surtur. This leads us to the abyss order and those who are in the Abyss itself. One such examples are the Abyss Heralds that worship the Abyss and its coming. Many of their attacks sing praises to the Abyss and speak of events like Revelation, the Rapture, the Truth, and even bowing to the Abyss. This is the sacred words and the runescribing that would be revealed to the sage who found the secrets of the cosmos, secrets of the Abyss. And they all do the same thing, worship the Abyss. Well, I think we've already seen it and have heard from it. But you might have also heard of subscribing to the channel. <laughs> yeah, that's right. The Abyss is telling you to like this video, subscribe if you haven't yet, and hit the bell for more of my content. Thank you. Now let's move into what you might actually hear from the Abyss. 
When coming into contact with forbidden knowledge, crazed whispers of some unknown entity will be heard, and it will slowly drive someone insane until they accept whatever the whispers say to them. These crazed whispers of forbidden knowledge can only come from the abyss itself and not from those who obtained it, like King Deshret and Nibelung. The crazed whispers I would think is something similar to the karmic debt that causes people to go mad in Liwe, a form of hateful will that is left behind by slain gods. All of these wills amounts to a single entity that Skirk likes to call curses. I've been training with my master, the Fowl, ever since I was young, and I have never returned to the surface since. So most of the information I possess, I got from him. It is only natural for those who are greater than humanity to possess a different sort of common sense. Which is why there are so many problems in our attempts to communicate with humans. Regardless, you should probably get rid of objects of misfortune to prevent any disasters from befalling you. To live in itself is a blessing. But once a person dies, the bonds he once had with this world shall all turn to curses. <sighs> No need to fret. These are just my... personal thoughts. And my reason for no longer wishing to return to the surface. The death of all things is intrinsically linked to the Abyss. And the Abyss, as well as forbidden knowledge, are an amalgamation of hateful curses of those who died. The only difference is that Skirk, Child, and anyone who can wield it can likely control the madness like how Child was taught by Skirk. This then leads us to the Sinner. I'm just gonna link another video to the Sinner because I can't reiterate it all. But the Sinner that we saw in 3.5, who is linked to the Upside Down statue in 1.4, I would say is also linked to the Sage or Ermine that was hanging upside down from a tree, which I theorized to be Ermin Soul and King Ermin when he discovered the secrets of the cosmos. The Sinner to me is the Abyss and can only be the Abyss ever since Helichurils existed in Tavat, which was thousands of years ago. Eleazar, forbidden knowledge, crazy whispers, and degradation of the mind and body. It's an existing energy which stems from the death of all things and causes madness to anyone it comes into contact with. A similar concept of temptation or truth that is found in Gnosticism, where the Gnostic serpent could be correct and the heavens are wrong. Many from the abyss speak of the same thing. The abyss is right and not the principles. Imagine if all the death and curses of Tavad became one and are sentient and would then come to Tevat, an invader from beyond that can change the world order and structure of Tevat, the fate of the world. Wouldn't that be something a descender could do? And wouldn't that trait be similar to every descender to date, including us, the travelers, and the heavenly principles? Piero was a mage in Conria who tried his hardest to keep the ruler of his kingdom from discovering the secrets of the cosmos. But the veil of sin was removed and everyone in Conria were made to experience the wrath of the heavenly principles as mentioned in the Pale Flame set. But since Conria was destroyed by Celestia for unveiling the secrets of the Abyss, Piero now wants to change the world structure of Tevat because of how Celestia approaches it, which is connected to the Saritza's wishes in the Shibada gemstone. Shouldering the grievances of the world and enduring her bitter cold, with our desire to burn from the cold, she then asks to burn the old world away, which is a rhetorical statement that Piero said on Signora's burial. Yeah, but Rosaline, I promise you. Your final resting place will be the entirety of the old world. Senora's boss fight seems like a smaller scale version of this too. The Fatui's goal doesn't concern one person, but the entire world, which is exactly the Saritza's bidding to burn the old world away. And to achieve that, one of their objectives is the Gnosis, even though one of them, or all of them, have the remains of the third descender, all to rewrite the rules of destiny, to change the heavenly principles' rules set on Tevat. 
this goal plus their missions to go to the Abyss from Scaramouche's voice line, plus Piero's knowledge of the Abyss and Celestia from what happened in Conria, means they'll use that Abyss to change Tevet's destiny, the Loom of Fate, and destroy the Heavenly Principles. This is quite a stretch, but we have quite a bit of names from Norse mythology that can make that happen. Sertologi is the Flame of Surtur, and he and his disciples use the Abyss in a flame-like manner. Other Abyss users, like the Sibling and Dainsleaf, create blue flames. Dainsleaf is the Twilight Sword, which is named after Surtur's sword, along with his name also being a sword that cannot be healed, while also being called the Bowkeeper, which is the Keeper of Secrets of Erminsol, the true history of Tevat. If all these characters and names come together at the end of the game, then we could possibly be putting together pieces of the fire giant Surtur, who in Norse mythology is the one who destroys all the gods and sets the entire galaxy ablaze. We're not even adding Rindotir's Heart of Nabarius, which could be used here as well since Nabarius procures and restores lost dignities. Dignity of Conria and the dignity of King Ermin. And that Rhine daughter has a primordial human project which could be related to the primordial one who likely created the heavenly principles. Then there's Shiva in the Shivada gemstone and is the Hindu god of destruction. So all of this put together would mean that Surtur is the abyssal destruction that the Fatui wish to recreate using the Gnosis. What about the third descender? How does it fit into all this? The dragons don't have any affiliations with the abyss except one, Nibelung, who initially brought the abyss into Tevat from outside the world, which is possibly how a third descender likely ended up within the Hydrognosis. The second descender could also be the second one, and the third descender being Nibelung after coming back with the abyss. So it's possible that the king would be affected by the abyss as well, forbidden knowledge, which could end up in the Gnosis after its creation. The first instance of the abyss is the first instance that the heavenly principles had to fight the abyss, thereby cleansing and sealing it away. Now what instance of the abyss is sealed away but is still spreading around Tevat? That's right, the sinner. The Abyss and Sinners were already mentioned since 1.0, with the first example being Rhindotter, dubbed the Great Sinner Gold. So it's only natural that the Sinner, sealed and chained in this stone, to be related to the Abyss made manifest. And it is also linked to the Upside Down Statue in 1.4, where we stop the Abyss from creating an Abyssal Abomination using the Field Tiller and the Osile. This Sinner of the Abyss is possibly the third or second descender and was brought here after Nibelong went outside of the world who was searching for a power that could defeat the Heavenly Principles which then was sealed away but his remains, as well as Nibelung's remains, ended up in the Gnosis. And what better way to name a being similar to the primordial one that destroys both the world and the heavenly principles than the Norse giant of the doomsday prophecy that is Surtur. With all that said, I think we should be ready for whatever Hobyo is cooking up in the abyss. The fact that Ankanomiya ruins are found in the Elenus region of Fontaine, as well as the apocalypse future that Rene and the Narciss and Cruz Ordo found, means to me that this is what the end of the world will be. A prophecy of Tevat. The skies will tear open, the abyss will pour into the world, and only destruction will be ensured for Tevat. This Ankanomiya ruin, I would think, are remnants of the ancient civilization that was destroyed when the second one descended into Tevat. This is connected to what the goddess of flowers says about invaders coming to Tevat as well as the divine nails in the ancient civilization and era of envoys. And to make sure that memory of the past isn't remembered because it was the first time the Abyss came to the vat, the Primordial One had to keep Ankanomiya and its survivors from coming to the surface. These multiple instances of quote-unquote finding the Abyss and the vat's many near-destruction events is a prophecy that will happen sooner or later, and it will involve the Abyss's coming as spoken by the Abyss selectors. Revelation, Rapture, The Truth. 
And there we go, a little theory about the implications, I guess, that these new characters of the Abyss may tell us in the future, all based on the current lore that we know. As always, I hope you guys enjoyed it, and if you did, please leave a like, hit the subscribe button, and hit the bell notification to stay updated on my content. So, comment below, is the world going to end, or is the vet still a happy, fun game? Honestly, this video would have been like twice as long than it should, but I can't really edit a 40-minute video without blowing up my war veteran of a PC. So we'll just keep it short and fun. Anyways, I'll see you guys in the next video, yeah? Like, comment if you enjoyed, subscribe, and hit the bell for more of my ramblings, and stay mad theorists. Bye!